Hello, and welcome to this eSchool Media webcast. My name is Andrew Barber, and I'm a senior contributing editor here at eSchool Media. I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation. It's sponsored by Zebra Technologies and it's titled Designing High Density 802.11 AC Wave 2 Networks. Now, before I introduce our speakers, I just want to take a few moments to highlight a couple of items. First, today's event will be recorded, so you don't have to worry about taking any notes. Uh, in a couple of days, you'll receive an email from us that's going to contain a link to the recorded event, and you'll also be able to download a PDF of the presentation from that same email. And secondly, please, please ask questions. You know, don't feel as if you have to wait until the end at any time in the course of the presentation. If you have a question, just type it into the Q&A box on your console and hit the Submit button. I hope we'll have a few minutes at the end when our speakers can answer your questions. Uh, we also have a chat function, which you can launch uh, using that blue group uh, chat icon down at the bottom of your screen. Please use chat to talk among yourselves or to contact me or the eSchool Media team uh, with any technical issues or, or any other concerns for that matter. But please don't use the chat function to ask uh, our panelists questions. They're just not going to have time to monitor the chat. So if you have a, a question, please use the Q&A uh, panel instead. Now with that out of the way, let me formally introduce our speakers. Uh, Chris Keckler is Executive Director of Information and Accountability for the Kenosha Unified School District, which serves more than 22,000 students in 50 schools in Wisconsin. And in this role, Chris guides both the Office of Educational Accountability and the Information Services Department and Chris is a strong advocate for promoting quality integration of technology and data for staff and students alike. Also with us from Kenosha is Angela Becker, the district's network manager. She supports and maintains the network and wireless infrastructure for the entire district, including a 10 gigabyte internal fiber ring, more than 950 access points, and 700 network switches. She also provides application and online testing support for the district. And joining us from Zebra Tech is Darren Herman. Darren is a director of product management, management leading the company's global product team for wireless access points. He's been actively involved in data networks for more than 20 years, architecting LAN, WAN, and WLAN networks, and implementing network management strategies. Well, welcome to all of you. It's a real pleasure to have you here today. Darren, why don't you get us started? Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you all, and thank you all attendees for taking the time today to talk with us and uh, consider this material. Before we talk about high density networks and how we some of the the new technologies available with the 802.11 AC, uh, let, let's first uh, answer this question: What is high density? And uh, this can be a, a tricky question to answer. Uh, normally, people say high density means the number of devices. Well, if I have a particular area, 100 square feet, 1,000 square feet, how many devices are in that area? And that is a good metric. So uh, what we try to do here on this slide is show some of those metrics and kind of put them in their relative position. So if you consider a, a warehouse and a logistics building where they have um, mostly boxes and they're moving materials in and out of a warehouse, uh, they have relatively low density of client devices. And as you move up into enterprise and retail education market, and events and stadiums, you can see that the number of devices per, in this case I'm using a chart, uh, per 1,000 square feet can increase dramatically. So at, at the far right of the scale, uh, events, stadiums, airplanes, things like this, uh, essentially this is, these are in the category of about one person using something every six square feet. If you think about a, a typical uh, stadium, a seat's about 24 inches wide, 20 to 24 inches wide, and about three feet from the back of the seat uh, to the front of the, the back of the next seat. So about two feet by three feet, around six square feet. Per, per person per seat. So that, that's where these numbers come from. And this is one definition of high density. Uh, classroom K through 12 sits right in that, that area, um, you know, 20 to 25 to 30 students per classroom, fits right in that area as we start to see the density going up. But that's not the only way we, design, we define high density. 
We also define high density by the amount of bandwidth that each device requires to, to accomplish the given task. So again, if we look at the left-hand side in warehouse and logistics, point-and-click type of scanning applications, it doesn't require much bandwidth. But right there in the education market, if we kind of focus in on that area, uh, that's the area that we, we typically see this 2 to 10 megabits per second of bandwidth required per device to, to be effective. Uh, this is per device. And then if you multiply the numbers, um, 40, uh, take the one in the middle there, uh, 40 devices per 1,000 square feet times 10 megabits per second, that predicts about 400 megabits per second required to, to do that, that application. That's very high density. That is definitely puts education market really at the crux of both the number of devices and the bandwidth required per device. So it puts it right in the crosshairs of what we call high density defined. You'll notice just a quick note on the right-hand side, we talk about stadiums, which also can, can dovetail into the education market, particularly at the higher end of the education market. Uh, the, the pink line tails off, and it does. That's per device bandwidth tails off. Typically, we see in stadiums, uh, it could be 250 kilobits per second uh, of video streaming, maybe a little bit more. Uh, but generally, we see lower lower bit rates per device, but lots of devices. So again, uh, we see that's the it's a multiplying factor. So high density is both the number of devices and the bandwidth that those devices are using. There's lots of good charts on the internet. We tried to simplify this a little bit here, and once you start talking about 11AC, we've got so many different combinations. It's definitely not as simple as G. 802.11G was really easy to figure out and was pretty simple as well. With AC, we've got a lot more going on. So we want to talk about 11AC as a, as a standard and what it, what it provides. Uh, the boxes are highlighted in green. 200 megabits per second, 867 megabits per se second, and 1733 megabits per second. Those th I picked out those three uh, because those really show some very common numbers that you will see as you start to uh, look into this technology and, and deploy it. Uh, 200 megabits per second, that's uh, about what you're going to get out of a first generation 11AC product, like a, an iPhone, an early iPhone 6 is one stream, the 6 Plus is two streams. Samsung uh, S5s, those are the, uh, HTC, those are some of the early products in the market that supported uh, the 11AC standard. Those are going to give you about 200 megabits per second, 40 megahertz wide uh, channel width, and, and uh, one stream devices. More recently, we're seeing these two stream devices in the market. So the new, the new iPhone 7, the, the iPhone 6 Plus, um, Intel-based Windows laptops. Uh, these devices are going to support up to 80 megahertz worth of, uh, of bandwidth. That's the width of the bands. We'll talk about that in another slide here coming up. And they're going to, they're going to support two streams. So they're going to cap out at about 867 megabits per second. And you'll see that when you start looking at spec sheets for the new, the newest smartphones, the high-end smartphones and tablets, you'll see that 867 number appear quite, quite uh, readily. And this is where it comes from. This is a two-stream device using 80 megahertz uh, channel bandwidth. And then, then the, I didn't highlight the, the one in the, the, the third one from the top. The new MacBook Pros, the, I, I didn't highlight anything particular because literally there's only one product. It's the MacBook Pro that has three streams. It's really kind of an anomaly in the marketplace and, and doesn't, uh, and, and it's just, it's not matched in, in the smartphones and the tablets. And then at the bottom, the 17, the 1.7 gigabits per second. When we start talking about, oh, 11 AC, well, that's cool stuff. That's, that's gigabit Wi-Fi. Well, folks, it's not really gigabit Wi-Fi, and this chart shows you why. Uh, oh, because of the number, every one of those streams at the bottom of that chart, those four streams, they all require an antenna. They require power. So t a lot of power, a lot of space is required, a lot of antenna elements are required. And so that's why we just don't find four stream, or for that matter, even three stream devices in the marketplace aside from the access point itself. Now that's actually something that we're going to leverage later on. We're going to talk about how can we leverage the extra capability in the access point. And we're going to talk about that when we get into this Wave 2 discussion. 
So this this evolutionary uh, process has has been fantastic with from 11N to 11AC. You've heard of 11AC described as well. That's that's 11N on steroids, and to a degree that's true. 11AC does a lot of cool things. So just highlight a few things here. Transmit beam forming. That's one of the cool things that AC does. That 11N did a very poor job. In 11N, beam forming was very random and not interoperable between vendors. With 11AC, it's standardized, it's interoperable. Furthermore, beam forming is the foundational technology used, one of the foundational technologies used, to deliver multi-user MIMO. And that's another really cool thing about 11AC is multi-user MIMO. And we'll talk about that a little bit further. The key takeaway here that I want you to understand is that 11AC is a capacity multiplier. There are multiple ways that you can add network speed and network capacity. For example, higher bit densities, QAM, using QAM 256 plus 33%. Uh, we can bond, uh, you can use multi-user MIMO to increase the, the, the bandwidth that we deliver concurrently at the same time to multiple client devices, 4X. We can do another 4X multiplier if we use 160 megahertz channels. So there's a lot of things that we can do to increase the speed. Now, not all of these things can be done at the same time. So some things are more appropriate in some markets than another. For education, some of these technologies are more appropriate for the classroom. Some are more appropriate for outdoors, some for dormitory housing, different areas of your enterprise. Uh, and, and education as an enterprise can, can be accessed and used different technologies from the 11AC standard. So we're going to get into some technical details here. 11AC, some of these key features. Uh, 256 QAM. That, that describes a technology that increases the bit density. It's, it's how many bits can be packed into each transmission time slot. And so with, with 11AC, it's kind of like looking at an eye chart. You know, with, with 11G, it's kind of like reading the, the top row the, the, of, of the eye chart. You can easily read the first couple of rows with 11G because the bit densities were very loose. So it was, you could get a, a lot of range. You could stand farther away from the access point and still get uh, your data rate with 11G. With 11N, you had to get closer to the AP to be able to see the eye chart, to be able to read the bit densities coming from 11N. With 11N, we have 64 QAM uh, bit densities. And so now we, we have to get a bit closer to the AP to realize those speed benefits. With 11AC, we want to get even closer. We want to get right up on that eye chart so we can actually see and get all those bits out of the air and really unlock that those those bandwidth speeds at 173 megabits per second per client, the 400 megabits per second per client. Uh, we want to, we want to get the access to all those speeds and, and speeds and feeds. Now this is uh, creates a problem. If we do this, if we put in a lot of access points, and this is where we start talking about high density, we're putting in more APs so that the client devices are closer and closer to the access point. We have a problem. The problem is the AP still supports all those old technologies. It still supports the, the 1 megabit per second, 11B. It still supports the G, the N. And so it's still advertising and sending out packets over a very, very long range, a range that we don't quite frankly care about, and we don't want the AP to advertise in these long ranges. We don't want to be able to see the eye chart from all the way across the campus. We want to see it up close. That's high density. So a couple things that we want to do. First of all, we're just recommending it flat out across the board. Disable 11B. It's not needed anymore. It's so old, just not required at all. We we just completed, a, a couple years ago, we completed a big project. This was in 2014, two years ago, in Las Vegas. Um, largest hospitality deployment in the world. It was 50,000 APs. And it was done in 2014 using uh, Zebra Technologies product. No 11B anywhere zero complaints. So turn it off, be confident. The second thing we want to do is we want to prune the advertisement packets. We want to prune the data rates so that we're not advertising those low data rates, the, the 6 megabit per second, the 12 megabits per second. We, we don't want to advertise those data rates at all because they have a great range. So we prune out everything below about 24 megabits per second is a good, is a good place to start. And what that's going to do is that's going to shrink 
the size of your wireless cell. You're going to shrink the, how far that access point can talk. And that's going to be a key factor in increasing the density in the network and getting more and more clients on the network. We've had some, some great success in doing this in, in classrooms. Uh, with Education Market, everything today is, is online-based uh, based learning. Uh, instructional units are all available online for uh, teachers to access, for students to access. My son's school, they, you know, they have multiple classes where they use uh, online uh, tools to, to do their training. So, so this is something that uh, we need to put an access point in every room. We need to configure it to, to really get it to control that size of that advertisement cell. Another key advantage of 11AC is channel bonding. So with 11 with 11N we could do 20 megahertz. That's a single channel. We could do we can do 40 megahertz. So now we can do 20, 40s, 80s, uh, 160 megahertz with 11AC. So we can get quite a bit faster than 11N uh, uh, by by adding more channels and combining them into the transmission. So the the sweet spot here is at the 40 megahertz. Uh, uh, bonding and the reason that there's, there's two reasons why uh, well, there's, there's one primary reason why that that's that's the sweet spot 40 megahertz it's because you need to, you need to be able to reuse channels so you don't have interference if you consider a typical school system and you think about one access point in each classroom how big is that classroom let's just say for sake of arguments a thousand square feet so every thousand square feet as you walk down the hall you have another access point well, the problem is those APs are going to start to interfere with each other. So what we want to do is we want to, we want to use channel sets, frequencies that do not interfere with the next room right next to it. In fact, we don't want the interference to occur until it gets quite a ways down the hall, all the way towards the end of the hall before we reuse the same channel set again. So in the U.S. market, if we use uh, DFS channels, DFS channels are those are channels that uh, are allowable with radar detection, and we can increase the amount of bandwidth by using those channels. We can get about 12 sets or 11 sets, 11 sets of these 40 megahertz channels. That creates a nice combination. It's a it's a really good trade-off between bandwidth, using more bandwidth, and and using and reusing channels so they don't interfere with each other. So 40 megahertz in education is is a really good trade-off. There are some some areas when the density gets very high. If the density gets towards the stadiums and the event centers, you might actually drop back to a 20 megahertz channel. So now you've got a, a, you've got another you've got about 20 channels that do not overlap with each other. So there's some situations where you're going to drop back to 20, but for most times we, we find that 40 megahertz is a good trade-off, and it gives us the best uh, uh, price performance ratio. Another key thing about 11AC is increased spatial streams. So 11AC, so 11N supported one spatial stream and two spatial streams. And now with 11, uh, 11AC, we're doing one, we do two, we do three, we do four spatial streams. Those are good things. Uh, every time you add a spatial stream, you're, you're adding more speed to the, to, the, uh, to the transmission. So if you notice, vertically in this chart, we start at 200 megabits per second, 40 megahertz wide channel. We go 200, 400, 600, 800. So, you know, it gets faster every time we add a stream. That's good news. The bad news is every one of those streams requires power to operate. It requires uh, an antenna, an antenna element to transmit and receive on that, on that stream. So smartphones and tablets are highly space constrained. And if you are following the news lately, uh, some of the problems that Samsung has had with the, the Galaxy Note 7 and their, their, the, uh, the famous um, exploding battery issue, you've, you've seen this on the news recently, that's caused by, by Samsung really pushing the envelope, trying to get higher densities on those batteries and use new materials compositions to create these high output batteries that will last longer and provide more power for that smartphone or that tablet device. And they, you know, they push the boundaries on that. Why are they doing that? Because all of these things we add to those smartphones require power and space. So this is the reason why it's it's not going until something dramatic changes in materials composition and battery technology uh, we're going to see the typical client devices whether it's a it's a chromebook used in a classroom or a personal device like a smartphone or a tablet 
they're going to stay around that two-stream mark uh, for the foreseeable future. So two streams provides us with a, a, a two streams plus 40 megahertz wide channels plus that high density 256 QAM. If we take those three things, it's the best combination of technology from 11AC that gives us the most widely deployable technology. And that adds up to 400 megabits per second. So that's that's a good thing that we can actually get a significantly higher speeds. Back in the back in the 802.11n days, uh, that number the the reality was that number was less than 100 megabits per second in reality. And today it, it's 400. So this is a, this is a number we see very commonly. So leads us into the next key technology. One of the reasons that you joined this meeting today is to talk about 11AC multi-user MIMO and Wave 2. So Wave 2 is not a standard, because there is only one standard, 11AC, but Wave 2 describes this feature right here, and it says that you need to support multi-user MIMO. Multi-user, that means that the access point can actually transmit to multiple clients at the same time. Uh, this is a this is a great technology that's been that's been worked on for many years and and it's really proving itself very very well in 11AC. The access point can transmit. It has four. Remember we talked about earlier the the four streams on the access point. Now if I can take those four streams and theoretically I can transmit one stream of the four to each of four clients that connect to me. So I can take I can do 200 megabits per second to each of four a total of 800 megabits per second at the same time. That's the theoretical max. In reality, it, it drops to around 2.5. It's not, it's not going to be a 4x multiplier. In reality, it's about a 2.5x multiplier in, in most networks. As more clients come out on the market, like uh, uh, the, the Chromebooks uh, today that are very popular in, in K-12, through they all support two streams two spatial streams. So those are going to be, uh, the access point can now transmit two streams to each of two of those Chromebooks. So now you have a 400 megabit per second connection to two different devices. That really is a sweet spot in, in, in providing this multi-user MIMO technology. So now we can take the access point, which has four antennas, it has four large antennas off of it. It's got lots of power requirements, and, and it's running all that power in the big access point. And we can take those streams and we can split them up into smaller chunks and send them out to the client devices where they can be consumed by a lower powered device, whether it's a Chromebook, tablet, smartphone, things like that. Uh, at the same time, the, the multi-user technology, the 11AC access point is backwards compatible. So it will transmit the standard uh, packets to uh, legacy 11N clients, uh, Gen 1, 11 AC clients, so it's faster for everybody. And overall, what happens is the network gets faster for every device connecting because when the AP can talk faster to some of the client devices, then all of the client devices get more time to, to, to transmit. So the AP can do one of three things. And this is where this is where the the logic and the the internal logic of the access point uh, is is required to to be very very smart. And this is where the vendors of the chipset vendors of this technology really earn their their keep right here, because for every opportunity that the AP has to send a packet, it can do one of three things. So first, it can send a, a single user stream packet. It can send out a, a so it'll just send out a normal looks very much like an 11N packet um, in a single user mode. And it can do that, and it will do that. So it uses that technology to, to send out the management frames to manage the network. It uses single user mode to support the legacy clients. Now, in that same time slot, it could, it could also choose to transmit a multi-user packets to one of four clients. So as we talked about that, that four to one ratio. Or it could also choose to send two streams to two clients. So it can do one of these three things each time it has an opportunity to transmit. It'll do one, two, or three. It'll always do the first one because it has to do the first one for backwards compatibility with all the client devices that are going to connect to it. And so really the decision is between the, the middle one 
will it do a four times one or will it be a two times two? And it'll make those decisions based upon the clients that are out there and what those clients tell the AP their capabilities are. So it'll make that decision, then it'll transmit to those clients. Overall, when you add up the first one, the second one, and the third one, we're seeing about a 2.5x aggregate network throughput improvement. So, uh, you know, if if if, um, if an early 11AC, early Gen 11AC product was transmitting 100 megabits per second in a particular environment, this one would do 250 megabits per second in that same environment. So we're getting about a 2.5x multiplier, and so that's a nice way to increase the the capacity and the density of the network. So basically how it works is it, it is using the, the standardized transmit beam forming. So it has to be able to beam form, or beam forming means to, means, to, means to narrow down the beam of the transmission so you direct the energy towards one particular client. Now it's not a pencil thin beam. It's not a, a beam forming sounds like a, a laser beam. It's definitely not a laser beam. It's, but it, it does direct the energy towards the left and towards the right in the direction of the client. Uh, what it also does is it puts a mark on the packets. So when the clients of so two clients, two students are sitting side by side on a table, um, it's difficult for the AP to beam form to those two clients uniquely because they're so close together. It's not a pencil. Remember, it's not a laser. It's a it's kind of a broad uh, RF energy. So by pre-coding, by adding a pre-code to the packets, those two clients sitting at the same table to, next to each other can still be able to identify themselves uniquely. So transmit beam forming plus this pre-coding enables this multi-user transmission. The client, the client device, this would be the, the laptop or the smartphone or the tablet, uh, will collect information about its channel, about all the information that it sees in its environment, and sends that information to the AP. So the AP now actually knows about the RF environment from the perspective of that client device. It doesn't have to guess. It actually knows because the client tells it all about it. That's called the channel state information, the CSI. Using that CSI, the AP builds a steering matrix, and this steering matrix is a very complicated piece of uh, piece of mathematics that uh, that that actually takes into consideration the channel state information from every one of the clients that the AP sees, and then it groups them together. It starts grouping them together. So, okay, this client A and client H over there. Well, these two are in a group, and then I can put B and I can put G into a group, and so forth and so on. It makes it makes these groups up. It makes up these groups of clients that can that can be capable of supporting a multi-user transmission. Then the AP sends out that transmission. So, some of the limitations here. First of all. This only applies to downstream packets. So it doesn't work in the opposite direction. The clients cannot transmit to the AP at the same time. So the upstream direction still applies. The same old rules apply as always from years and years and years that only one device can transmit at a time. So downstream only. The second the second thing is this applies to uh, only to some data packets. So it doesn't so all the management packets are still single stream. So all the so so there's there's a limitation on on that as well. So when we start to look at this technology, that's why we that's why we're not because of these limitations. That's why we're not seeing a four x multiplier. Uh, and we're seeing a about a two point five x multiplier in these these networks because of those uh, those limitations. So some of the, the, the increase here, again, uh, between 50% and 250% increase in total aggregate speed, it works very well in the education market uh, because if, if people are walking quickly through uh, an airport terminal, it doesn't work so well. Remember in the previous slide we talked about the access point um, collecting a channel state information from the client. So the client actually tells the access point about its view of the RF network. So if the client is moving through, to imagine an airport terminal, well, that client is changing. Every step that the person takes is changes all that channel state information. It changes constantly. The AP can't keep up with it. So it doesn't work so well when devices are in high motion. But it works extremely well 
in, in portable networks, more portable and less mobile networks. So people sitting in a stadium, uh, sitting in a classroom, uh, a lecture hall, uh, works extremely well in these kinds of environments. So the education market will be a, a, prime, a prime example of using this technology to, the, to its most benefit. Uh, it does take some time for that, to calculate that steering matrix, so again, mobile clients are not going to work so well. There's been a, a big evolution in this 11AC uh, technology. So we started out, uh, the, first, the first technology was available in, in, in 2013, and, and there was some technology that was released uh, in, at the end of 2013 some access points that were three streams, three by three, colon three, and they were wave one. So they were first generation 11AC. And those technologies unlocked a lot of those things we talked about. They unlock the, the higher QAM bit densities, the 256 QAM. They support the transmit beam forming. They support the, the wider channel width. So all those good things, but they did not support multi-user MIMO. So that's Wave 1 products, released um, in the marketplace in 2013 and through the, through the um, first half of 2014. Then there was a, a bit of a lull period in which we kind of settled down to see what the, what the technology would look like. And then starting uh, in mid-2014, there, there was a short period of time when people were, were introducing some 11AC Wave 2 products. We actually start calling them Wave 1.5 because they didn't quite support all the things that were needed to be supported. Particularly, they didn't have the four concurrent multi-user MIMO clients. So because they could not support four concurrent clients at the same time, it really limited the, the, throughput, uh, the, the throughput improvements that those products could, could do. But people are really waiting for the last one, which is which is uh, a true wave two technology, four by four colon four colon four, which it means that the antenna, the access points have four antennas, they can transmit four streams, and they can support up to four concurrent multi-user MIMO products at the same time. So that, that's where we are today. Those technologies uh, only became on the, came on the market really just this, this, this past year, um, it's really 2016, at the end of 2015 and this year, 2016. And the timing is really good because if you look at the bottom of the chart and you look at where the, the client devices have been, the client devices just have not kept up with the access points. The access points were, you know, there, 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 there was a big mismatch between capabilities. The very first multi-user MIMO client was a, a Xiaomi from in China. It couldn't even buy it in the United States at all. Uh, and that was released in, in you know, just uh, last year. So, so we had a, a real lag here in, in the client devices being able to support the same technologies at the access points. Now that's changed. So now we're talking here at the, towards the second half, the uh, middle of 2016, uh, and the second half of 2016, and now we have two stream MU MIMO clients in the market that can support this technology. The Google Nexus 5, uh, Samsung's, the, the new iPhones. Um, I haven't seen the, the, the latest teardown of the iPhone 7, but I'm looking for that. I was looking this morning, I didn't see a good teardown showing the Wi-Fi chipsets in there yet, but from, from what we believe in the industry insiders that the iPhone 7 will support a, a two-stream, uh, two-by-two multi-user MIMO radio. So we're looking for that in the, in the teardowns to see if that still supports it. So now we're able to close the gap between the access points capability, four streams, and the client's capability with two streams. We're now able to close that gap today. And so this is a good time to be talking about 11AC. A bit of a matrix here, um, and uh, you know, take these recommendations with a, you know, as just recommendations. Certainly not hard fixed rules, but it's clearly in a classroom, a lecture hall, uh, you want to focus on wave two technology is going to give you the highest density, and those technologies will also um, be able to unlock some additional services like location-based services, um, uh, application QoS that can be used to enhance the, the student's experience. So classrooms and lecture halls will be high density, lots of people, lots of bandwidth required. So it fits our, our description of high density. Uh, in the, you know, your, your basic uh, skills training, uh, ROTC, music classes, where, where online learning it, it may not be the primary, uh, primary technology, 
11 AC wave one, wave one still going to unlock a lot of network speed that, that you need much, much faster than 11 N, 4X faster than 11 N easily. Uh, dorm rooms, uh, more difficult time getting wave two to fit into that technology, but because in dorm rooms you need to get the APs, you need to really look at look start looking at micro cell architectures. You need to get the APs right inside the rooms where those students are to get the right kind of density um, uh, pairing up and to control the interference between APs. So in dorm rooms, we see a lot of success these days with with Gen one 11 AC products that have multiple Ethernet ports, and they put the signals and the RF signals right inside the dorm rooms. So we're seeing a lot of success in that product. Outdoors, we're seeing a lot of success with Wave 1. Uh, wave 2 likely will not work outdoors because the, the lack of reflections. So in order for multi-user MIMO to work, you do need to have MIMO. So MIMO has to work for multi-user MIMO to work. And that's where you run into some difficulties in outdoor environments. So uh, you don't get the reflections that you do with an indoor network. So it's a bit more difficult to, to get it to work, the technology to get the value out of it. So we're seeing the most bang for the buck today with, uh, with Wave 1 products. And stadiums, um, Either one, uh, very, very high density, very high, lots of people, lots of bandwidth required uh, for stadiums and event centers. Just a couple quick examples here. This is a, an example of a high-end 11AC Wave 2 product, 4x4, four, four, four streams, and also supports some, a lot of value-added uh, features like um, uh, integrated Bluetooth, integrated spectrum analysis, integrated dual band uh, sensor for, for network troubleshooting. The, the red box there, the dual band sensor can be used for wireless intrusion prevention. It can be used for location services. It can be used as a network troubleshooting radio. So it can give you a real high-end network that is incredibly fast and self-testing and, and self-optimizing and self-healing. Another one very similar to that uh, with, with IoT extensions, and this, this has the same, tech, same features as the first one, uh, the same capabilities to, to detect the, you know, for spectrum analysis, for Bluetooth, for BLE. Uh, but we also added a thing with, uh, to extend IoT applications. And IoT, Internet of Things, means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So, so uh, it, it, it's a technology that we need to try to support and, ex and extend. So with, with uh, this 8432, what we added was a PoE out port, so power over Ethernet. We're going to bring power over Ethernet into the access point, and then we have extra power that we're going to put out of the access point. So you can connect up a, a camera. If you want to put a camera on the AP, you can do that. Plug it right into the port, pulls power from the AP. We can also use that for uh, an, an IoT gateway or even another access point. So this, this is kind of a neat way of, of taking, of, of combining both the high speed and high density of 11AC with this new emerging market for IoT. And we're going to see that in, in every market, including education. And one quick note here, uh, again, microcell. So microcell APs for dormitory housing, this is a three and a half inch it's three and a half inches square. It's it's really tiny. Snaps onto the wall. It's got multiple Ethernet ports, layer three ports. You can route. You can you can bridge packets. Do anything you want with that. Dual radio, 11 AC uh, with multiple Ethernet ports. So lots of capabilities for for higher education with dorm house dorm rooms. Okay, uh, I'm going to now trans transition this uh, this presentation over to Angela and Chris, and take us through some of their material as well. Show some practical applications. All right, thank you, Darren. That was a, a very a good uh, presentation and, and uh, certainly a lot of information. Um, certainly benefited us. Uh, Angela and I just want to kind of highlight uh, how this has impacted us from a local level, working with a, a large footprint organization with, with multiple offsite areas and tens of thousands of users uh, for Kenosha Unified. Uh, again, we are the uh, third largest district in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we just completed our official count day last Friday, so uh, due to a declining birth rate that's that's been hitting obviously the well the nation for uh, several years, we just went under 22,000 students. You can see there the the breakdown of of those areas as well as the amount of sites that we have. Uh, we are a uh, uh, majority minority population as far as ethnicity demographics. 
Uh, we are just about 51, 51 and a half percent free and reduced population, and so there is still a noticeable amount of our users that, uh, in a home environment, do not have a, a stable or non-existent uh, computer and, and uh, availability to internet access. So that is something from an educational integration standpoint that we always have to keep in mind. That as much as we work to improve the educational structure of our network capabilities and access to resources in our building sites to try and manage that and make sure that it's not conducive to a negative environment or experience for students that may struggle with that. We just want to kind of show you that uh, similar to other organizations and other entities that we, we've worked uh, over the last several years and specifically over the last two or three years to greatly expand our, our bandwidth to the internet. We've had to upgrade our core components, the network switches and content filters and firewalls to uh, and work with our ISPs to ensure that we're able to deliver on these faster rates. But this goes hand in hand with the with the noticeable growth and uh, teacher adaption of uh, new devices or online platforms or collaborative utilities that uh, that teachers are integrating with the classroom and then also passing that availability on to the students. And so uh, our expectation is to hit hit our 2016 mark uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of our wireless history here in the district. Um, prior to 2010, we had multiple vendor wireless environment, which was only in about 5% of our buildings. We had that managed through individual wireless controllers. We then moved towards Zebra Wireless, and where we installed about 700 and a little over 750 access points throughout the district. But at that time, our main focus was coverage. Um, we're gearing a little bit more now toward capacity in certain areas, but at that time it was basic coverage. So what we did was we installed our access points, mainly in the hallways, and they would typically cover about four classrooms. Um, since then, we've installed almost 250 additional access points and a VX9000 controller to support our environment. Um, in the last couple of years, we've had a real big boom with wireless devices. So we have approximately 19,000 wireless devices on our network at any given time. We're hopeful um, in the next few months that with upon E-rate approval, we'll be able to add an additional 1,200 access points to our environment. Uh, what we're using right now in the classrooms are the AP7502, and that would mean that we would have a, an access point in every instructional classroom in our district. We try as a school district to keep up with the Wi-Fi standards. So looking at some of these new products, it's really exciting to see where the technology is going. Um, moving toward AC technology in education, it's really nice to know that a lot of this technology is backwards compatible. We do have a lot of older devices you know, three to five years plus, and um, this technology can be supported for older devices as well as new devices. Like I mentioned before, we're hopeful that upon E-rate approval, we'll be able to move forward with some M-gig technology, which will allow for maximum speeds for our access points. It should be able to provide us higher data rates, and it would be nice to see that the data can be delivered to multiple users simultaneously. Obviously, in an educational environment, cost becomes a, a great concern and factor, and so we have to be very careful that the decisions that we make on, on small-scale uh, testing environments and then hope to broaden out to large-scale uh, practicality inside the school environments on a, on a uniform level, that there's great consideration given, given to that. And so we want to take additional time and be a little bit more proactive in, in how we understand the end user's experience. And so we, we don't just test in, in demo environments inside our controlled IS environments. We want to go out to those end user areas and, and really work and talk with those uh, variety of teachers. A lot of the uh, initiatives initiate or, or, or come forward due to some of the power users at the uh, schools, but obviously then they're the models that other teachers that are maybe the second tier or third tier adapters look towards on, on how they want to start integrating some of that technology in their own classroom. Uh, we uh, are fortunate enough that uh, we have a, a pretty strong presence of uh, our technology support technicians, our first level responders, and, and all secondary buildings have a dedicated technician 
and uh, a couple of the larger elementaries do as well, and then the remaining ones share a uh, technician, one technician between two buildings. So in that regard, our, our expectation of a response time is pretty rapid, and that's, and that's physical on site. There's obviously a variety of instances that we're able to troubleshoot and, and address and solve uh, help desk tickets in a remote fashion, but we want to always ensure that as we expand and, uh, the toolkits, the technology toolkits for the teachers, that even if they do run into issues and we try and not help them understand that they will, that they understand that their support structure is readily available and accessible and, and not leave it at a point of discouragement. We've also taken great care to work from the, in, uh, the information services side of uh, the environment with the uh, teaching and learning department that we have, uh, our instructional technology group. And so we, we've instituted regular meetings where we kind of get on the same page, if you will, not only just the technical aspects of how something will be deployed or how it will be addressed, but also what the expectations are from an educational standing, how the students are going to be using the devices or technology, what their end goals are, how they, how they hope to uh, share those experiences and, and really get uh, a quality outcome for them. So we're, we're uh, trying to broaden that partnership as a, as a, at every turn, both at the central location of our support center but also at each building level. And then, as Angie mentioned in our history slide, you know, prior, prior to integrating this, the, the inconsistency, uh, and that might hit home a little bit more uh, uh, directly with some of the audience members here, is that when you look to implement something like this, we went through those pain points, and it's, you can try and counter that with good quality communication. Uh, I was, uh, at the time years ago when that first started at one of the larger high schools, and, and so we did start to get the uh, blanket coverage of, of a Wi-Fi environment, and so we were able to uh, adapt and utilize that technology a little bit earlier. But then when we would go to peer-level meetings or department meetings where we would interact with some of our peers at other schools, they would see these examples, but then unfortunately not be able to take uh, advantage of them, or they'd have to wait in line or have an inconsistent environment. And so uh, having to address those pain points and being a little bit proactive and understanding and communicating what project timelines are really really gets the message out and helps in that. Uh, you know, and, and Darren's slide on the chipset evolution really spoke to that as well, trying to work with that mismatch between the client environment and what the uh, technology or the APs are able to uh, develop. And so, um, you know, we're really hopeful that we're going to, in, in this year, implement a very consistent, broad-level, uh, full-coverage environment that is consistent among every building and so that when teachers or staff or students travel in any one of our campus regions, that, that there's no disruption in that service. I want to talk a little bit about um, the technology advancement for our districts pertaining to multi-user MIMO. Um, one of the things that we're really excited about, and it's a big possibility for us now, is the potential to support uh, BYOD for student devices. We piloted one a few years back. Um, it, it was somewhat successful, but now with these type of technologies, um, you know, student devices bringing in their cell phones, we think that especially the 8432 access point would be able to have the capabilities to support that type of environment for us. Uh, we've been piloting them, and we have a few of the 8432s in our environment already, and some of the noticeable differences already is the amount of devices that it can efficiently support. Um, the, the device number has increased per AP, but there is no noticeable slowness. Um, to the end user, nothing has changed. Um, it, it's been very effective. We're also a really big Chromebook users. Um, we have a lot of Chromebooks in our districts. Our, we are Google Labs for Education. We support that environment. And so having that amount of Chromebooks on our network and students logging in to the Chromebooks to log into their drive, having these new access points, there has been no latency with logins. Um, there's also no latency when it comes to logging in with our online assessments that we've been running. Uh, we feel that these access points are, have the potential to serve more users more effectively. Um, some of the things that we're looking for for our future expectations with running this type of technology, uh, oh, this past summer we had some major, major stadium renovations at two of the large high schools. We added network and wireless to the press boxes. So what that does for us is it allows for our local radio stations to come in and do a live broadcasting and streaming for our local sporting events. 
Since we've had those up and running, there's been no delay or buffering with any of the game media. Also, um, being the size district that we are, we are able to host many large events. Uh, that being said, though, we also have the potential of supporting 1,000 plus concurrent users at those events. This past summer, we hosted the EdTech Team Southeastern Wisconsin Google Summit um, at one of our local high schools. We also support regional professional development, um, as well as school site collaboration meetings. So you could just imagine with the size district that we have, the amount of people that could be on our network at one time. So I think having this type of technology would be really beneficial for those type of events. Uh, we also work, like Chris had mentioned, closely with our instructional technology department. And there's been a need in, well, actually a request in um, implementing Google Classroom and Google Hangouts throughout the district. We really feel that this kind of technology would be able to provide a stable environment for um, us to be able to meet that request for them. And thank you for uh, listening to our portion, uh, Andrew. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, Angela and Chris, and, and thank you, Darren, uh, for what was really a, a very detailed and informative discussion about uh, the relative merits of different access points. Uh, we have a little under nine minutes left, and we do have some questions. Uh, some of the questions have already been answered, and you can, if you can see them loaded into the, the Q&A, but uh, we have some others that uh, we will try and tackle. Uh, you know, why don't we turn back to Darren? I'm going to come back to you. The questions I wanted to get to is, is but why not use uh, 11AC Wave 2 APs everywhere? Well, that's a good, yeah, that's a good question. And, and the answer to that is, is if you, if you have the budget to do so, then it's a good future proof, um, um, future proof idea. But in, in, pr in practical terms, it's not not very practical, and let's explain why. Uh, a wave two access point is going to require more power. It's going to it's going to require more antennas to be effective, and to be effectively beam form, it requires four antennas, and to effectively support multi-user MIMO clients, it needs four antennas. That's that's not a cheap access point to to design and build. It's a very expensive access point, so it comes it brings with it a lot of cost. So, really, if you can get it. If, if it works, and, and in the future, what's going to happen is a lot of this technology is going to be shrunk down into smaller components, and so I think it will come down to a price point. But today, there there is no there is no price performance benefit to putting 11 11 AC Wave two everywhere because you're going to pay extra. It's going to be physically larger. It's going to be more cumbersome to install. So your cost to buy it, your cost to install it, your cost to support it is going to go up. And at the end of the day, you're just not going to see a, um, a value for that out of that. Um, and just as a quick, uh, uh, one of the, I just see a question come in here uh, from Michael Sharp from American Networks. Uh, PoE power requirements. Thank you, Michael. That's a, that's that's a perfect follow-on to that comment. It, generally, you're with with Wave Two, you have to use 8023AT. You just have to. Uh, we do support some AF profiles that limits the the capabilities of the AT. So, but why would you do that? You know, why would you limit the, the performance of the AP? You're going to spend the extra money for the AP. You really want to put a, a an 802.3 AT power supply. With Wave 1 11 AC, we can do full performance uh, without compromise on 802.3 AF. All right, terrific. Well, thank you, Darren. Uh, I'm going to stick with you with, with another question uh, that's come in. Is, is and as you look at the, at the overall network, what should be, you know, a school's expectations in supporting 11N, 11AC, Wave 1, and Wave 2 clients on the same network? I'm sorry, repeat the question one more time, um, Andrew. Um, what, what, would, what, what should the school's expectations be supporting 11N? 11AC Wave One okay. and Wave Two clients on the same network. Ah, thank you. Yeah, so so it is fully backwards compatible. So the expectation is, if you buy Wave Two today and all the devices in the network are 11N, no problem. It works as 11N works. So it's in, entirely. So this is where it it can be actually. Um, 
a future-proof technology. You can buy 11AC Wave 2 today, use it with your 11N and your first-gen 11AC, and over time, as more clients and devices support the Wave 2 standard, that network will get faster and faster and faster. So it's, it is a good investment. It's not a wasted investment if you have mixed clients today. Uh, generally, my, my personal feeling is once we get towards middle of next year, you're going to see the, the 50% threshold crossed in, in, in mobile devices like smartphones. 50% of them will be, will be Wave 2 capable. And I think at that point, you're really going to see these networks get a lot faster. Uh, so it's it's a it's a good future proof investment. Okay, great, thanks. All right, we have a set a couple more questions in. Another question just arrived in from someone who said, if we use forty megahertz on the five gigahertz side, does that mean if an AP is on channel thirty six, it uses both channel thirty six and channel forty? Yes, thank you. Good question. Yes, that's exactly. When you use 40 megahertz, the two channels have to be adjacent. So it's 36 and 40, then 44 and 48, and so forth and so on. So they have to be adjacent on 40 megahertz. Um, interesting. Now, start adding that up. If, what, what if you wanted to use um, 80 megahertz? So it'd be channel 36, channel 40, channel 44, and channel 48. Four channels have to be immediately adjacent to each other. So you can see that as you start to use more and more channels, get wider and wider width, you're going to run out of channels to combine. So that's, again, another reason why 40 megahertz is, is the sweet spot. Okay, right. And, you know, I think you already addressed one question on this uh, from, from Michael. I'll ask another one. Who wants to know that does the WAP power requirement increase with the number of endpoint devices or users? And as an example, he says, like, 50 Chromebook login. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Uh, the, the radios today's technology is pretty good. We see a big change. There's a, there's a change in, um, in the power profile of the AP around the 20% mark, 20 to 25% mark. So, so if the AP is utilized, if the CPU is, and the, the CPU and the, the radios are running at about 25%, so let's say, uh, let's say 200 megabits per second or 100 megabits per second, that, that's going to be a low power profile. Once it crosses the 25% threshold, it, it flattens out. So now you're going to support your speeds and your number of clients. It does not change by the number of clients. The AP is largely unaware of the number of clients that are connected to it. It's, uh, it so it, that does not change the power profile at all. So once you cross the 25% threshold, you're going to be using you're going to you're going to the, the power curve is going to flatten out. Okay. All right. And, and looking down down the road uh, at, at future releases from Zebra, do you have uh, are you planning to release more Wave Two APs? Yes, we will. Uh, we, we certainly will. We have a, a good portfolio to, 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 to upgrade, to change. Uh, we're working closely with the, the primary chipset vendors to uh, identify uh, w what's the next phase in 11AC. And one of the things we're looking at in particular is, is, is shrinking the, the components and getting the components smaller, getting the components to consume less power. If a, if a, if a, if a radio consumes less power, then we actually can do more with the access point, right? We can put more functionality into the AP, the less power that it draws and consumes. So we're looking closely at, at the next generation technologies, and with everything, we see, we see higher performance coming out in the market, and we see less power requirements to deliver that high performance. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to a question that, that you did answer the, the person who's, uh, who asked it, but I thought maybe we could share this with a wider audience. And the question was about roaming and beam forming. And the understanding of, of the person attending was that you lose this when you're in a warehouse roaming. Can you, can you talk to that a little bit? Yes, you absolutely do. Um, and, and this is where when, when devices are moving around a lot, um, like warehouses is a, is a, is a key market. Uh, we do a lot of business transportation. And a mobile computing device, by the way, people put, put our devices on a forklift and then they're driving through the warehouse at, you know, 20 miles an hour. And yeah, beamforming doesn't work. It just flat out doesn't work. 
because because the the client device is moving far too quickly. You need to have an omnidirectional antenna pattern. You need to just design your your classic RF uh, design in in that case. So we we don't see multi-user MIMO taking off in in some of that warehouse markets. We see a, a lot of Wave One Generation One Eleven AC products, which gives us uh, we've got some. We see a lot of that technology uh, using that market because it's it's low cost and it's and it has a lot of price performance benefit. Uh, again, one of the things you know, the future next year, not only are we looking for higher density, you know, uh, lower power consumption products, we're also looking at, at developing higher temperature uh, rated products. So you're going to see technologies from from Zebra um, coming out that that supports higher temperature um, higher temperature operating environments. Okay. Well, terrific. Well, thank you, Darren. Um, that is all the time that we have left today. If any of you asked a question that we were unable to get to, um, someone from ZebraTech will follow up to get you some answers. And we also have, if you look at the Q&A slide, there's also a, a bunch of resources there that, uh, that you, can, uh, you can check out, and we will be able, you'll be able to uh, download those from the email that we send out. So, so as we wrap up, I want to thank Darren, Angela, and Chris again for a really excellent presentation. And also like to thank ZebraTech for its support. And so one final reminder, we will be sending out that email in a couple of days that will have a recording of the webinar that you will be able to download. So thank you all for attending. And this concludes today's webcast. Goodbye. <laughs>